so first of all, thank you for sticking with this study this long. Uh, we're this morning in uh, the second letter of John. We've got one more lesson to go, and uh, I know watching videos is less desirable in doing Zoom than uh, being in person, so I know we're all looking forward to the time when we can do that again, which probably the next round of Bible study will be that way whenever that is. So we're in 2 John. It's a short uh, letter. You've got 13 verses that you're thinking about, but I'm glad we're taking so much time on, on this because there's a lot going on in uh, these letters that we would do well to notice. And there's a couple of things that he says that are so important for us just to make sure we see because they're, they're probably more relevant in the year 2021 than they were when... Uh, pen was put to paper. This is definitely a, a, a John letter. Uh, so in 13 verses, he summarizes uh, so much of what his gospel is getting at and then what we learned when we were uh, reading the first letter of John. Uh, the themes of uh, that he's interested in clearly are, are jumping off the page just in these 13 verses. You can definitely tell it's, it's him, or, or if it's not directly him, it's certainly uh, somebody who's sitting next to him, uh, kind of, uh, he's dictating to them or something like that, a close friend or, or disciple. But I mean, the, the themes all come out, uh, truth and, and mutual love, uh, the, the new commandment, Love one another as I have loved you. Uh, he mentions the Antichrist in here, that those, there are those who, who are uh, deceiving the faithful uh, and have put their trust in Jesus Christ and telling them don't do that. Again, a, a big theme of uh, 1 John. And then uh, integrity of witness, that there has to be truth and love. So, so John's concerned with all these things in his first letter. We see it come through in his gospel, and we see it uh, come through here in 2 John. So let's kind of jump in. Okay, so the first verse brings up a couple of questions. You know, he, he says uh, he identifies himself both in 2 John and in 3 John as the presbyter. Uh, in, in 2 John, he's writing to the chosen lady. So, you know, if you're me, you're going, okay, what, what the heck's going on here? What you need to know is presbyter is a word, we, a word we find all through the New Testament. It means elder, uh, and it's synonymous with, and it's where we get the word priest from later on. Sort of as presbyter comes into the English language, it, it jumps a little and becomes priest. And so uh, whoever this is, if it's John again or one of John's closest buddies, and the fact that he doesn't identify himself as John, this author, uh, may give some credence that this is, you know, kind of the, uh, the curate, if you will, of uh, St. John, uh, the, the Father Matthew of uh, whatever church this is. Uh, maybe. We don't know, right? So it's speculative. Uh, traditionally, the church has thought this was St. John or, or some scribe of St. John. But presbyter means elder or priest, some people have, uh, you know, taken that to mean that that could necessarily not be a young person. Uh, but then, of course, we have St. Paul's letters to St. Timothy, who we know is young. Uh, and we know St. John himself is a very young man uh, from his own account in the gospel. We know St. Mark is a young man. So, so the, the, some of the pillars of the early church were themselves young people. So we don't want to get too caught up in the idea that they have to be older to be in elder, um, if that makes sense. He's writing to this chosen lady. Okay, so, so who's the chosen lady? Well, there's a lot of speculation about that. Is this a specific person? Uh, the word chosen here in Greek is kyria, and so it could be somebody's name. It could be like kyria lady. All right, so maybe this is to a specific person. That's what some people have concluded. Or chosen lady could mean a, a sort of a clever um, literary device to mean a whole Christian community of chosen people. Remember, uh, a strong element of John's understanding of the church we see come out in the book of Revelation, which is the church is the bride of Christ. 
And the church throughout the ages has always been referred to in the, in the feminine pronouns, right? So she, uh, and sometimes you hear people say something about like the mother church. Um, and and just, like, uh, just like a boat is usually uh, called a, a feminine name. Well, the, the church in the same way, it doesn't mean the church is a female, uh, but it, it referred to in uh, the feminine because of her relationship as the bride of Christ. Remember the book of Revelation, of course, has this imagery running all through it, uh, that the church is the bride and our Lord Jesus is the bridegroom. And, and this is a John way of thinking. We see it over and over again in his way. So maybe the chosen lady is uh, a Christian community, a, a parish church or something like that. So we don't know. Uh, but it's helpful to think of it as not just directed to just one single person, um, but to a, a community of believers, because then we begin to get some of the benefit of, of John's teaching, if we can do it that way. Okay, in verse 3, we see something jump off the page. Uh, and, and I'll just read it. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, in truth and love. So, uh, truth and love. And I hope you've seen by now that these are themes that keep coming out, and it's no mistake that John keeps going back to these. Because, of course, truth and love are the two great things that every single human person is after in life. I mean, if, if you think about it, right, Truth is uh, the pursuit of all knowledge, and you can think about the great links that all of us have gone, both uh, formally and informally, uh, to educate ourselves. Why is it important to know anything? Uh, well, clearly, uh, as a people, we think it's important to know things. So much of our, our activity is directed towards the pursuit of truth. So, so all of us uh, understand that inherently, that, that truth is one of the great things we're after in life. And uh, the, perfect, uh, the perfect example of this is when, uh, when we have politicians who tell us half-truths, we're outraged. You know? How could they not tell us the truth? So built into us is this uh, understanding that telling the truth is important. And pursuing knowledge and pursuing the truth is uh, right at the heart of what it means to be a human being. And then love, same thing, right? The, the pursuit of love is so much at the center of human activity, uh, all of our pursuit of relationships, all of our, our social uh, uh, connections. We're inherently social because we are pursuing love as human beings, both the giving and receiving of love. So truth and love are, are right at the heart of what it means to be a human being. And so John keeps coming back to these two things, truth and love. And it's no mistake that Jesus is the man of truth and Jesus is the man of love. He's the one who ultimately satisfies all of those core human longings. And that's what he comes to reveal, right? I mean, he says uh, about himself, uh, that I am the way and the truth and the life. He is the man of truth and all pursuit of truth, whether in any academic discipline or any informal pursuit of truth is from the Christian understanding, the pursuit of God himself, the, the, the person of Jesus Christ, the one who is truth. So studying physics can be and is the pursuit of God himself. So from this way of understanding, it's not like, well, we've got religion over here and then we've got you know, science over here. If we, are, if we are ready to make that concession, then we are in real, real trouble to give our witness. And remember, John is talking about an integrity of witness here. Uh, what we see is we see God is the creator of truth. And in many different facets. And so God himself is truth, and the pursuit of truth is at the heart of what it means to be a human being, and the pursuit of truth is the pursuit of God, the pursuit of the one who, who is truth. And same thing, uh, St. John's told us in his first letter uh, about love that God 
is love. And so any pursuit of love, uh, which we know that every single human person needs, uh, and it is a need, it's a core need. I mean, uh, uh, that itself is also uh, the pursuit of God. So truth and love are, are right at the core, and he's coming back to those over and over again, and he comes back to them throughout this letter, and, and uh, he, he's been hitting this heavily throughout his gospel, throughout the first letter, uh, and then through these letters as well. I guess the last thing I would say about truth and love is that you can't have one without the other in John's understanding. And we understand this also from St. Paul, who tells us, you know, that the right way uh, to conduct business is to speak the truth in love. So you, you can't just, uh, if, you, if you're just a person pursuing truth and you're not pursuing love, then, then really you've also missed what it means to be a human being and you've missed what it means to be a child of God. So these two things, truth and love, what we want to understand is that they always go hand in hand. You can't love someone if you have a, a misunderstanding of who they are, a, a misconstrued version. You have to have the true version of them to actually uh, love them. All aspects of reality are that way. It's about truth and love. And so here we see that we will have grace and mercy and peace. We will dwell in Jesus Christ in truth and in love. He goes on to revisit a, almost an identical phrase from uh, 1 John. This is not a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. And I hope that phrase stood out to you when you read it because it's a, a direct lift from what we just read uh, back in 1 John. What is from the beginning? The commandment to love one another, right? That this is right at the core of our faith. And so it's something, it's a daily pursuit. It's something we, we need to turn our eyes towards loving one another. What is love? And then, as I say that, the song, Baby Don't Hurt Me uh, No More, uh, appears in my head. But what is love? Uh, it is that uh, we should follow the Father's commandments. Again, this is a direct lift from 1 John. So God loves us. He tells us exactly how to live our lives in love and in truth. Uh, and we aren't going to have a lot of success in life apart from the commandments of God. And so... Uh, walking in his commandments, again, as he says uh, in 1 John, is not burdensome. Uh, in fact, it lifts a burden off of us because it helps us to figure out how to navigate through life successfully. So the, the longer we continue to see God's commandments, is like, oh man, these are such a drag. I've got to follow all these rules. These are so lame. Uh, the longer we can continue to do that, the, the more trouble we find ourselves in, the more difficulty we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in, in brokenness. Uh, so if we want to love, we orient towards God's way of life. We understand his commandments are a description of what a successful way to live life looks like. So again, he continues to repeat this over and over and over again. It's so important for us to notice this. Uh, it's from the, the teaching of Jesus himself as he quotes him in his gospel, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will send the helper uh, to you, the Holy Spirit who will be with you forever. And then we get to verse nine. And I want us to notice verse 9 of 2 John because it's, it's, it's a verse for our times if there ever was one. And probably a verse that's, that's at least as easily appropriate in the year 2021 as it was when John wrote it. Probably at the end of the first century-ish. Uh, so maybe in the 90s. Um, uh, 
uh, maybe. Here's what he says in verse 9. And anyone who is so, quote, progressive, end quote, as to not remain in the teaching in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. So what does he mean when he, uh, when, when, at least in my Bible, uh, progressive is in air quotes, you know, is he talking about uh, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? Uh, I, sorry, I mean, that, that, uh, that may be somebody's preferred interpretation, but, but that's not what he's getting at. He's talking to what we know um, are some Gnostic teachers. Now, Gnosticism is probably the first heresy in the life of the church. And Gnosticism has all kinds of, of different uh, renditions or different versions. Uh, but at its core, it means that, well, there's some secret knowledge that some people get to that the rest of us can't get to. And it typically, Gnosticism in some of the variants uh, tends to think that the spiritual is better than the material. So um, without going too far into Gnosticism, what we need to know is, is just there is this, there's this teaching, there are these teachers that are going around undercutting the teaching of uh, the apostles and of John himself. And they're telling people, no, that's not the way. You need to progress further. Intellectually enlightened people uh, start where all, all of the Christians are, uh, but they progress further to understand some greater spiritual truths. Now, this is exactly the thing that is right at the heart of so much of 21st century uh, Christianity and 21st century cult, Western culture. Uh, there are those folks who say, well, I mean, yes, of course we start with the Bible, but, but nobody really believes that, that all those things in the Bible could actually happen, do we? I mean, this is, and this is at the core of, of all the problems that we had in the relationships with the Episcopal Church. Um, it, it's right at the core of, of a great divide that's happening in 21st century Christianity, no one really believes that, uh, that Jesus was actually raised from the dead, do they? I mean, it, that's what, yeah, of course, you know, sort of simple-minded people think that. But those of us that are progressives, uh, we've achieved a more elite status uh, where we understand things uh, more robustly and therefore understand greater spiritual truths. Or nobody actually believes that God cares about uh, your sexuality or anything like that, do they? I mean, that seems awfully outdated. And so we want to recognize what's going on in the first century church. And we want to recognize what's going on in the 21st century church. Uh, because the problems aren't all that different. This is, this is a problem that the apostles themselves were up against. St. John himself is up against this problem. And there are people, the reason he writes this letter is clearly there are people who are coming into the church who are teaching things that are contrary than he was teaching. And there are people in the church who are believing the contrary teachings. That is the subtext for why 2 John gets written. But he gives a, a, a stern warning here. Anyone who is so, quote, progressive as to not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Again, John works really well in black and whites. So either you've got God or you don't have God. And if you think you're progressing beyond the teachings of Holy Scripture, uh, St. John has a warning for you, whoever, and then he, he gives a promise after the warning, whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. And so we want to joyfully receive the apostolic teaching, and we want to be clear that there's always been other teachings 
that are outside of what the apostles have taught, and that Christians have always been called to reject those teachings, even from those who claim to be leaders in the church. This is one of the most difficult parts of uh, the, the challenges we had with the Episcopal churches. There were, there were bishops and leaders and people that we should have been able to trust and look up to who were, who were outside of the teachings of Holy Scripture, outside of the teaching of the apostles, which we find you know, right here. And, and, and then we were confused and we were upset because we didn't know exactly what to do. Well, we can imagine that the first century community is in the same boat and St. John is saying, do not listen to these people. And then he goes on even further and he gives an even uh, more uh, uh, ramped up approach. In verse 10, he says, listen, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, and what does he mean by this doctrine? The doctrine uh, of Jesus Christ incarnate, uh, crucified, risen from the dead, and ascended to the right hand of the Father, the, the core tenets of the Christian faith. If anyone comes with it, he says, don't greet them, don't even talk to them. So what we're led to believe is that there were these people that were trying to get into the church to teach in the church, trying to lead the faithful into new, enlightened spiritual truths. And St. John is saying, don't have it. Don't even talk to them. Put them out. Don't greet them. Don't listen to them. They will lead you uh, away from the Lord. And we have this challenge, right? Because uh, we can uh, let them in, these 21st century teachers, on our Facebook feed, in our iPhone. I mean, we don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to, I mean, we don't let anybody... Uh, uh, come and, and address uh, the faithful here at St. Lawrence who, who, who are outside of the apostolic teaching and witness, but, but the message finds its way to us all the same. So we have a warning uh, to be very careful about who we listen to and who we want to follow. The last thing I guess I might say is uh, in verse 13, there's something curious and then, then I'll be done. The children, this is what he writes, the children of your chosen sister send you greetings. Well, okay, so is this the, the actual kids of this lady's sister and why is St. John sending a greeting? And again, we can think of it that way and, that, and it's certainly possible that this is a, a person that he's referring to. Or it's possible, again, that, that it's a community, right? So a chosen sister might be a, a sister community of Christians somewhere else, right? So, so maybe the community that St. John himself belongs to, your chosen sister community. So the, remember, the, again, the church is described in feminine terms. And we have this even to our day, uh, even to our own day. Sister parishes, they're sometimes a cult. So um, the children of your chosen sister may well just mean a, a fellow group of Christians. I hope these studies are helpful to you. I hope the discussions uh, are, are really profitable, uh, helping us sort of sort out. Uh, I've said, you know, it, it, we want to be careful to not listen to those that are outside of the mainstream, but it's not like they wear a sign for us to help us identify them. It's very difficult at times to for, sort of figure out well, what is mainstream Christian Orthodox teaching and what is not. Part of the way that we begin to be able to discern that is by doing this type of study and sharing fellowship with one another. It helps us to sort of know uh, the, the faith when we hear it and to know what's not the faith when we hear it. And so we want to remain in union with Jesus Christ, remain in truth and in love, which brings us into fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. So I hope these studies are profitable to you, bless you in your study of Scripture.